Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of Voices of Africa on the platform Chat Night. November 6, 1982 to November 6, 2022. Cameroonian President Paul Bia commemorates 40 years in power. But before Mr. Bia was President Amadou Ahijo, who had been at the presidency for 25 years. In the eyes, in the minds of Cameroonians, Amadou Ahijo was omnipresent and omnipotent. Put simply, he ruled the country with an iron fist. Cameroonians dreaded whispering President Ahijo's name even in the privacy of their bedrooms. And so talking about him resigning could earn you death in one of the most atrocious circumstances. Cameroonians, 40 years after Ahijo continued to wonder what the hours and minutes leading up to him resigning looked like at the presidency. Today on the show, Voices of Africa, to answer my questions, but also yours, because we are going to open the phone lines for questions from the public, is Dr. George Ngwa. Ladies and gentlemen, join me now in welcoming Dr. George Ngwa on the platform. <laughs> Dr. George Ngwa, thank you for accepting to take my uh, questions on the platform Voices of Africa on chat night. Thank you for hosting me. Thank you, sir. This disclaimer, Dr. George Ngwa was one of my teachers in broadcast journalism. I hope tonight he gives me at least a nine on 10 in my manner of hosting. That said, Professor Ngwa, um, you were not in Ahijo's inner circles. So how did you find yourself at the presidency on that historic day? Yeah, I was in, I served as a broadcaster. That is, I was editor in chief of uh, Radio Cameroon in the news department, but I also served as a re presidential reporter for uh, Radio Cameroon. So I used to accompany the president uh, on trips nationally and abroad. So that is how I got attached to the presidency while serving as editor uh, in chief of Radio Cameroon. Dr. Ngwa, on the day Ahijo resigned, what did you see or hear? That's just before his resignation, just before you people at the national radio station announced or ran that tape announcing his resignation. What did you see or what did you hear? Well, um, since the beginning of the year, we had gone on several trips with Ahijo to England, to Spain, and then uh, locally, uh, we had gone to the Adamawa, uh, Adamawa division that is in the north of Cameroon, uh, visiting Banyo, and, um, and uh, Tigné. So uh, there was no inkling that something was amiss. So, but we remember that uh, on our way home from the official trip to Spain, uh, he seemed a bit tired and he asked to be dropped in um, Nice where he had a, a, a home. So we dropped him in Nice, that was in, uh, I think it was in May. And he stayed there for about a month and then returned home looking as fit as a fiddle. So uh, fast forward to early November, we had absolutely no inkling that uh, something was going to happen until that morning or oh, around midday we were called to the presidency that is uh, four of us two technicians and two reporters and uh, we were asked we went to the presidency 
thinking that it was one of those diplomatic occasions that he was probably receiving a, a foreign envoy and then we we asked to interview the envoy at the end of the the, the meeting with Ahijo that that was not why we were invited there. We got and we sat and waited and waited. Uh, while we waited, we saw uh, politicians from the ruling party, this the ruling party, the CNU, being received or ushered into a office, either in small groups or singly. So until we were invited in, and that's what struck us at about 3 p.m. We were invited in and we were asked to, the technicians were first invited in and asked to set up their recording equipment. And then we were asked to follow. We went in there and uh, as soon as he started speaking, it was a big shock. It was a big shock to us. We didn't believe what we were hearing that he was about to resign. Interesting. I mean, Doc, uh, uh, Dr. Ngoa, Ahijo was that kind of person who had this aura around him. He just commanded fear, not respect, necessarily, in terms of Western traditions of leadership or democracy. How, describe to me, how was Ahijo looking at you people? What was the atmosphere in the room at the presidency? Are we talking about the current presidency or the old presidency? We're talking about the new presidency in um, Unity Palace. Uh, he had just moved to Unity Palace, um, I think, a couple of mo months before, uh, leaving the palace, the presidential office downtown, and uh, moving to the new palace. And um, so it was our second time to go there. But it was quite a beautiful structure, huge structure, huge offices. So he was there and we got there. He was looking quite somber, looking tired, looking stern as usual. So that's how he appeared. Interesting, who else were in the room at the time that this recording was taking place? Who was the Minister of Communication at the time and the Director of Radio Cameroon? Uh, the, the Director of Radio Cameroon was uh, Mr. Koko Amese Alexandre, and the, the Minister of uh, Information and Culture, as the ministry was called then, was uh, Mr. Guillaume Bwele, uh, who, was, who used to be a teacher, a university lecturer, before he, he was appointed. Um, as Minister of Information and Culture, but they were not at the presidency. They themselves didn't know what was going on. So... Now, you, you are sitting there, question. you are sitting there in front of this mighty figure, this guy who was feared across the country. What's going on in your mind? I mean, is it like you're holding your pen and you're having some chills running through your spine and you're trembling, your fingers are trembling like somebody who is suffering from, I don't know what. Um, so what was running through your mind there? Well, we didn't know. We didn't know exactly what was going to happen. But as he started speaking, I mean, you talk about cold sweat. <laughs> All of us were sweating because that was something that had never happened. In fact, in Africa, I think it was the third time that an African president had resigned. I think uh, Julius Nyerere, uh, Sen Seda Senghor, and now Ahijo. So we had no inkling, absolutely no inkling that President Ahijo was going to quit. In interesting. Um, you sit there, and I can imagine that you, 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 you Dr. Ngwa, you were one of the harshest critics of, uh, I mean, you exuded what they call Anglo-Saxon journalism, 
And um, when going to the presidency, did you think that, well, it could be because of one of the things you've said that, well, you're just going there to your Golgotha as Jesus Christ well, for crucifixion, or did it run through your mind that, hey, look, it could be one of those editorials, those commentaries, are, you were in Cameroon Report, correct? Yes, I was uh, editor of Cameroon Report. Who else, but, who uh, else were those with you on the Cameroon Report desk? Uh, we had a, a bunch of colleagues, some of them senior, the late, um, uh, we had uh, Luca Nanga, we had um, Pien Gome, we had uh, occasionally Eric Chinje, because Eric had left radios, but he was, he made himself available for comments. We had Ben Bonga, my colleague and classmate Ben Bonga. So there were, there were quite a few of us there. So you you are going there, and because Cameroon Report, I have to be honest with you, a lot of us grew up thirsting for journalism because of your performance on Cameroon Report. I, I mean, I, I remember I couldn't miss an edition on the Sunday morning. And so you, you, you're you being told to go to the presidency, which was, you know, didn't look quite right to you. You didn't also could tell uh, you you couldn't also tell why you were being taken to the presidency. Did you did, did it come to your mind that oops, it could be one of those things that I've said that's taking me to to my crucifixion to the hill when where I'm going to be nailed to the cross like Jesus Christ? No, 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 no. That was we have been someone before. I've been someone before, but it wasn't the presidency uh, for you know talking about being called to answer. Uh, it was a Monday morning routine, and um, often it was the minister who would contact my director and then would grill me. I was given a grilling or at times given a warning and so on, you know. So, but it was never the presidency. If the president was dis not pleased with what had been said, he would uh, contact the minister of information and culture, and then the minister will contact uh, the director of radio. So that was how uh, that was managed. If the ambassador, American ambassador was unhappy, and often he was unhappy about uh, commentaries that had been made, he would contact the minister of communication, who would then contact the, the director of radio. But Ahijo never directly, or the presidency, never directly contacted any of us when you and, did yes sir. sorry i interrupted and, and often the call or the invitation quote and unquote would come directly from the director to report to the secret police the political police uh, uh Sene at the time or gdoc at the as it used to be called so that's how it worked. It was never directly from the presidency. The presidency, we went to the presidency to report on events, to interview guests, and never to be questioned, and not to be questioned. You, you were, I said before, that you were one of the virulent critics of uh, uh, government action through your program, your magazine program, Cameroon Report. Now, we're going to go back to the resignation of Ahijo. Tell me a little bit. Walk us through what, how the newsroom ran each time you did an edition. Did you have to submit the recorded material to the director of radio and then it goes up the chain of command? Or how was it done before you were given the green light to broadcast an edition of Cameroon Report, sir? Yeah, we, we usually had a meeting during the week to discuss topics that would feature in the Cameroon report of uh, of that week, which was broadcast on Sunday morning. Uh, we took quite a different approach from our Francophone colleagues. Our, our approach was much more critical. You know, we were much more critical. And uh, although the minister wanted to know exactly what was going to be said, and who was going to participate? We in the, at the English desk. We seldom gave him the details of what we agreed on topics, but we seldom discuss the the details of what was going to be said. 
you are watching Voices of Africa on Chat Night Africa. My guest tonight is uh, Dr. George Ngwa. George is described by many as one of the founding fathers of the Department of Journalism at the University of Boya. We'll come to that. Uh, the next question I have for you, sir, is the resignation of Ahijo wasn't a subject anyone would dare to speculate on. Um, how did this happen from your reporter's observation? How did this just come about? I think there were signals already. When we were in Bafusam in 1980 for the uh, CNU Congress, National Congress, uh, there were indications that uh, he, he wanted to seek power. Even before then, uh, in Douala, there were indications that he wanted to uh, seat power. But many people thought that was just a political gimmick. He was trying to, you know, uh, fly some kites, political balloons. But from 1980 till he resigned, there was no indication. The country was booming at the time. He was uh, receiving visitors businessmen from all over the world who were interested in investing in Cameroon. It was a boom economy at the time. So there was no indication until that day. Now, that day, you record President Ahijo um, resigning, announcing to the country that's going to resign. When you left the Unity Palace, for the radio, and I want to tell everybody that at that time there was no television in Cameroon. Were you escorted by members of the presidential security? Or you just jumped into your car and drove off? Just walk us through, help us understand, sir. No, after the recording, um, we drove back to radio. That is the the four of us. We drove back to radio and straight to the pre, uh, to the director of Radio Cameroon and handed him the tape. That was what we were told to do. In fact, the director of civil cabinet at the presidency, after the recording, invited us to his office and gave us clear instructions about not talking to anybody about what we had heard. So, <laughs> not even your wife. <laughs> we, and then he instructed us to go straight to the director and hand him the tape. And that the tape will be given back to us once there was a green light from the presidency that we could go ahead and broadcast. So that's how we, we left the presidency directly to radio and up to the director's office. He himself was shocked. And thank God in those days, we didn't have cell phones. <laughs> we didn't have cell phones to call anybody and, you know, let the cat out of the yeah, back, so to speak. But we did that. We went back around 4 p.m., handed the tape. Around 6 p.m., the director called us and said, OK, now you can edit the tape, clean it up, and we make it ready for broadcasts. So we locked ourselves up in a, an editing booth and then edited the tape because Ahijo had a uh, uh, cough. I think it was due to the fact that he was a chain smoker and he, he often cough when making a speech. So we had to take that out. out. So we did. And uh, once it was ready, we uh, the, the director had invited the Minister of Communication. So he joined us in the booth. And, uh, that was the first time he too was listening to what Ahijo had just said. He he was quite surprised himself that Ahijo had just resigned. Who were the other Francophone colleagues uh, handling this with you, doing this with you? It was, uh, there were three Francophone colleagues. There was my uh, director, Joseph Marcel D. Uh, there was my colleague from the reporting service, uh, Jeba Malam, and uh, there was a third. Uh, I've just forgotten the name. Okay. Um, so now, this is this is George Ngwa, 
uh, Jaguar Malam, Joseph Maxelndi, you have the secret of the state in your hands. In other words, you 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 privy to information which the rest of the country doesn't have, and and you're wondering should did it did it, did it occur to you maybe you go home and tell your wife or just say whisper to your wife, honey. This thing is getting different too. The country is not going to be as it, you ever knew it. Did it come into you to tell somebody? Because usually, no. why, why I ask this question, Dr. Ngoa, is because when you have that kind of powerful information that you have in your hands, it's like a jackpot that you win, you are eager to tell somebody. Did you have those feelings running through you? No. Uh, why? Oh, then because, because if you did jump for Shiva, it was going to come after you if you heard it anyway. The instructions were clear and the consequences too were clear. So the consequences of revealing any information you were privy to were quite clear. So even our colleagues in the news newsroom didn't know what was going on. Okay. So, the... Um... The tip is broadcast. I remember, I mean, we people were shocked because Ahijo resigning wasn't anything that anybody had in his remotest corner of the brain. Nobody, I mean, nobody could see this coming. But okay, it, it gets announced on the radio. What were the reactions of the Anglophone elite given that no one saw Ahijo's resignation coming? Who were you as a reporter, as a journalist, observing to see what their reactions would be? Uh, the, the reactions came the following day. But that evening, the, 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 the tape, the speech was broadcast around 8.20 p.m. And by that time, most people had gone home. And, um, and usually what signal an important, an important event to be broadcast was that the news was delayed. Once the news was delayed for 10, 15, even 20 minutes or 30 minutes, that was the signal that something important was going to come. And uh, by the time we finished broadcasting the tape, the, the speech, and uh, we drove downtown, the town was empty. Everybody had locked up. People no, had gone to sleep. You know was happening yeah. next. Yeah, people were afraid because Ahijo was a fixture for 25 years. And nobody thought that he would resign under any circumstances. So once they listened to the speech, those few people who were in town, they headed home. Bars were closed. Shops were closed, and that was it. The following day, now the news was the topic that was being discussed everywhere. The resignation was being discussed everywhere, but in hushed tongue because nobody knew what would happen. Some were happy, but the majority of people felt, I think, relief that their overbearing presence of Ahijo had finally come to an end and Bia was being sold. The new president was being sold as a liberal person, a person who would bring more freedom. So that's, that was the topic of discussion. Well, the, whether, the yeah, whether Cameroonians have or enjoy more political freedoms under Bia or Ijo, we're going to come to that discussion. Dr. Ngwa, you had the Solomon Tanding Munas there. And other people, Ben and Fallon, I believe, was also there. I mean, you're talking about the high-ranking Anglophone Cameroonians. What were you hearing from them? Did you go to them? Were you at some point assigned to go to them for interviews, uh, analysis? What were they doing? What were, how were their reactions? You know, um, following the resignation of uh, President Ahijo, we had a meeting in the radio house and with the minister and the director, and we were asked to produce a program that will be broadcasted, broadcast after the inauguration of uh, President Paul Bia. So um, the Francophones had a list of guests. We decided to go out. I, I invited my colleague, Sam Nouvala Fonkem, 
uh, Victor Epiangome, and we strategize on who to uh, invite to the to the program to be interviewed. The idea was to have um, a roundtable discussion with all these guys, Fon Long, who was there from the onset, uh, um, Foncha, who was there, uh, Muna, who was there, Egbetabi, who was there, Zoe Kangaki, who was there from the beginning. So we decided to uh, invite them to a roundtable discussion on uh, Ahiyo's stewardship of Cameroon. And uh, look look forward to uh, Bia's um, to Bia's in to the incoming president's leadership. That was what we did. So we went to each and every one of them and invited them to a roundtable discussion. Wow, it wasn't customary for people in the elite circles to say what they thought. When, when you met these personalities, do, do you have a feeling that they were sincere in whatever they were saying, whether about Bia or about Ahijo? Yeah, I, I, with, I started with, uh, with Foncha. I went to Foncha's residence behind the National Assembly and we had a discussion. And he told me, look, George, um, to be frank with you, uh, Ahijo never treated the Anglophones as equal. And at times, the problem was Anglophones never agreed to present a common front to Ahijo. So Ahijo would dismiss them at times and so on. We, we went to Egbetabi, uh, and Egbetabi, oh, you know, as a lawyer, this guy could talk. So he had no problem. Fon Dong told me, George, you better be strong because I'm going to take over the interview, the questioning, because I have a few things to ask my colleagues, political colleagues. So that was what happened during the, so we finally agreed on a date to be interviewed. Unfortunately, two days before the discussion, roundtable discussion, uh, Pamuna pulled out. He, he called me and said, look, I'm not going to be part of that roundtable discussion. <laughs> so, so I asked him why he had given us his, uh, uh, go ahead, why he pulled out. He was pulling out. He said, look, um, some of your colleagues told me that you guys are, were planning to ambush me. So I would not be part of it. So that threw a spanner in the works. So we, we huddle and then agreed that, okay, to have Muna, it was important to have Muna as part of the, the team discussing Ahiju. So we decided to, we opted for uh, individual interviews and then to splice the answers together and broadcast as if we had we had them around the table. So the same questions were asked each and every one of the past participants. You are watching Voices of Africa on Chat Night Africa and my guest tonight is uh, Dr. George Ngwa who happened to be around where the events were unfolding. And we thought that if there was anybody to come tell us the story as it happened, as the news broke, it'd be this gentleman who is a professor of journalism. My name is Divine Chiamokong, one of his students some time ago. And I'm glad to have Dr. Ngwa on the set today on Chat Night Africa. We love Voices of Africa. Keep watching! Now that you are watching, my phone lines are open. If you have a question for Dr. Ngwa, by all means, dial the number 240-603-7367. 240-603-7367. Would you say, as a journalist, sir, there were more greater freedoms, public freedoms slash press freedoms, during Ahijo's time or currently on the beer? Uh, I would say that basically 
the, 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 we enjoy more freedom under Bia these days, uh, under Bia than under Ahijo. Ahijo, it was clear there were laws that uh, ban freedom of expression, freedom of the press, and so on. Even re gatherings, it was impossible to hold gatherings. The censorship, you know, you had to submit a copy of your newspaper before publication and to uh, a censor in the Ministry of Territorial Administration. He would okay and, or ban the paper. During the first few years of uh, Paul Bia, that practice continued until 1990 when the so called uh, freedom laws were uh, adopted. But then, you know, uh, habits die hard. And it has been, under BI, it has been freedom by default. People keep on pushing the envelope. And um, at times they get hit, at times they get away with it. But there have been more freedoms under BI than under Hijo. Doctor, well, how would you say that when you had this critical program, Cameron Report, under Hijo, with everybody knows, Jean for Shiva, how did you sail through? What was the fine line you, Ben Bongang, Eric Chinji, and the rest, Konka John, before uh, Sam Novella Fong came? What were the fine lines you had to walk in order not to provoke, not to be seen as poking your noses, noses into the face of the lion man, the lion guy at the 2D, and, and, and yet still exercising the Anglo Saxon journalism fire that was in your belly? How did he do this? Uh, and and at the same you, time, you uh, say uh, Aijo was a dictator. Yeah, to be frank with you, I think I, they paid more attention. The government paid more attention to what the Francophones were saying than to what the Anglophones were saying. You know, we got away with that because uh, they often dismiss us. You know, les Anglo, they're, they're up to something. But that does not mean that we, we were not reprimanded. We had we were reprimanded several times, over and over, but we, we, we were not knocked off. Here is we a question. Knocked. Here is a question from Mr. Jum Jinyo. He's watching from Central China. Jum Jinyo says, "What would you honestly say engineered Ahijo's sudden resignation?" There has been speculation that uh, uh, but never proven the speculation that he was pushed to resign by the French president at the time Mitterrand because Mitterrand allegedly Mitterrand and Hijo never saw eye to eye so but that has never been proven I think uh, he was tired he was tired and he had accomplished a lot of what he set out to do uh, the civil war had come to an end in 1970. The economy had picked up. The, so I think he thought he had accomplished what he set out to do and that he could engineer a very safe handover to somebody who had worked with him going back to the early 60s and who worked with him and he knew they knew, knew themselves very well. So he thought uh, he, uh, his successor would be manageable. He could manage you know, how to run the country and so on. But uh, as to why he resigned, well, I think he had, had, to do, had something to do with that. So today, yeah. yeah, today you have. Um, the armed rebellion going up, uh, uh, going on in the northwest and southwest region of Cameroon. We are seeing a lot of divisions among those who are uh, carrying arms. Those who are federalist, we see divisions, cracks, fractured front. You just alluded to a disunited front, Anglophone front, to Ahijo. Let's talk about what was happening then. Why do you have this disunity? What was coming in between? What was the wedge between Anglophone elites at the time in, 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 in Yaoundé? 
Well, it was not even uh, only in Yaoundé. It, you know, it went back to West Cameroon, to Southern Cameroon, to West Cameroon, and it, it had with. I think it had to do with this multi-party system. Uh, we, Anglophones were used to having differences because of their political, but that did not prevent them from working together. Ahijo, the, Ahijo's perspective was different. Ahijo wanted all parties under one bound. And that's what he had in 1966 by creating uh, CNU and merging all the political parties, but that didn't work quite work. You see, um, Anglophones, there will always be differences. In fact, that makes democracy, democracy stronger. That's not a problem. But where it, become, where it becomes a problem, where it becomes a problem is when it becomes self-defeating. If you can't, if we can't all agree on a single objective, then how do we sell ourselves to? So that, 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 to me, basically, that's the problem. How is it that if it's if it's a mark of democracy, which I don't contest, but how is it that Francophones faced a disunited Anglophone front? and they were united. What was uniting Francophones and not Anglophones? Uh, Francophones grew up under a different system, a very autocratic and repressive system. So they knew exactly where they stood, what to say, and when to say it. Most of the time, they didn't say anything. They just went along. Anglophones would say, no, we don't tolerate that. We, you know. We, we can't speak with one voice. That's 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 not democratic, you know. So there's a difference. Whereas repression was used a lot in East Cameroon, we saw it as children growing up because of the war of independence. There were lot lots of freedoms. Francophones were deprived of lots of freedoms, but that was not the same with Anglophones. You are watching Voices of Africa on Chat Night, and my guest tonight is Dr. George Ngwa. We love Voices of Africa. Keep watching! Dr. Ngwa, Cameroon is a diversified country. You have about 250 languages or more. You have about 300 political parties. Do you think that the diversity of Cameroon is an asset or a problem? It shouldn't be a problem. You see, it shouldn't be a problem. It becomes a problem when we instrumentalize a diversity, use it to subvert basic freedoms, use it to subvert uh, progressed towards development, political progress, and so on. Having 200 and so, how many of them, most of them exist only on paper. And we know why, you know, we know why. So diversity is not a problem. It becomes a problem only when it is used to subvert uh, political freedoms, uh, basic political freedoms and individual freedoms and human rights. You have traveled the length and breadth of the world, Africa, outside of Africa. Um, arguments have been made, Dr. Ngwa, that freedoms in Africa, press freedoms, public freedoms, ought to go with or sync, ought to be in sync with the level of education or development generally. Do you agree with that? Do you intellectuals tend to assess freedoms, political freedoms in Africa through the lenses of the West? And if yes, how is that fair? Well, uh, whether we like it or not, for good or bad, that's what happens. Freedoms in Africa, in Africa are judged against a, a Western uh, yardstick, you know, 
you, you remember, you recall that in the 70s and 80s, when the when African countries rule through single parties, one parties, uh, you 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 know, there was a talk of uh, lack of freedom. There was talk of uh, responsible journalism, you know, non-critical journalism. So all those things, but that was a mark of the time. That was a mark of the time. So, but now, what would justify controlling some, by the way, there's no such thing as total freedom of the press. Even here in the West, we know that freedom can be controlled in several ways. For example, in the United States here, you know, freedom is controlled through too much information. The individual cannot process all that is on his plate. So when you can process all that is on your plate in terms of information, you know, you don't know what is happening. You don't know what is happening. Dr. Ngwa, yeah, Dr. Ngwa today, uh, Bia, is, Bia and his supporters, or those who look up to him favorably, they are commemorating uh, 40 years of his leadership. Looking back 40 years, would you say Cameroon has deteriorated? I know that you said there have been more freedoms under Bia now than under Hijo. What's your assessment of Bia as president of Cameroon for 40 years? Uh, I would say that uh, in terms of social development, uh, there has been a lot of, Cameroon has regressed. For example, corruption is rife. Nepotism and tribalism are pervasive. Excuse me, are pervasive. Even development roads, we there are no roads. There are few roads all over. Uh, there are few roads in the country. Schools are falling apart. Hospitals are expensive and falling apart. So, it, Cameroon has. Uh, suffered much regress in the past 40 years. Uh, in the 70s, just before Hijo resigned, Cameroonians were very optimistic about their future. They were paid on time, they had schools, they had scholarships, they had whatever, you name it. Salaries were paid on time. But nowadays, we have a debt, huge debt of at least $5 billion. And we don't know what has been done with that money. Now people steal in billions. They don't steal in hundreds of thousands or in millions. They steal in billions. So when you factor all that in, we haven't done a good job in the past 40 years. The other day, I interviewed the subsection president for Northeast London, uh, Dr. Elvis uh, Mboge, and he said, well, it's unfair to lay all the blames on Bia because Bia works with people around him, his entourage. What's your reaction to a statement like that, sir? <laughs> Bia is the only person who has been elected nationally. He appoints and dismisses uh, ministers and so on. So the responsibility is his to call these guys to question all those who have failed him in terms of implementing uh, government policy should have been fire, uh, fired. So he is the only person who is answerable nationally. So he bears the blame. What's the role? What should be? the role of the diaspora in fixing things back home? Well, uh, first of all, the country has always resisted. Uh, I, I don't know whether it was under Hijo or under, uh, under uh, Paul Beer, 
the diaspora is often seen, is often not trusted. For many years now, there's been talk of dual citizenship, there's been talk of voters voting, the diaspora voting in national elections, but it has never happened. It has, there was even at times the idea of a ministry in charge of the diaspora, but it didn't happen. So there is a lot of the government is very suspicious of the diaspora, which is myopic because most countries uh, receive a lot of funding transfers, cash transfers from the diaspora that fuel their various economies. Nigeria, for example, billions, tens of billions. India, why should Cameroon be the exception? You know, the laws that should encourage the diaspora to come home and invest and their investments protected are not there. They're not there. So the diaspora is not playing the role that it could have been playing in the development of Cameroon. You are watching Voices of Africa on Chat Night. My name is Divine Chamukong. I'm anchoring this broadcast from Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. Dr. Ngwa, you were one of the founding fathers of the Department of Journalism at the University of Boya. If you were called back home to draw up a curriculum for a journalism department in Cameroon, what would be your emphasis? You know, we're moving now away, the world is moving away from traditional journalism, radio, the broadcasting, newspaper, they're going more electronic and so on. So that has to be factored in. That has to play a key part in any new curriculum for a journalism, school of journalism in Cameroon. We are moving there away from the traditional uh, journalism. Unfortunately, in Cameroon, we are still stuck. We are still stuck in uh, teaching subjects such as uh, broadcasting, teaching news writing that doesn't fit with the current expectations and so on. So basically we we'll have to look at that and discuss that. And then so that we bring our the journalism uh, up to date and align it with what is happening in the world. It is not as of now. Thank you, Dr. George Ngoa. Um, before we um, um, have you uh, have your last word, let me say, Dr. George Ngoa, my profound lecturer uh, in those days at the University of Boya. That's a comment there by uh, Jack Mum, uh, Muna Ngumba. Probably you recognize the face of the name. I don't know. You've taught a lot of people journalism. And the, yeah, he's and, in the Caribbean. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. So, yeah. I, I happen to keep in touch with lots of my former students. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. No, because when we started the department with my late friend, Professor Eno Tanjong, you know, uh, the idea was to create uh, a family to bring students and teachers together and create a family. That's why we are always in touch. We have always been in touch with our former students. And uh, so to encourage the, the family idea so that we can rely and feed on each other. I will be coming uh, to you for your last word. Uh, let me just give you a minute of, uh, maybe a minute to take a glass of water or so. You were watching uh, Voices of Africa on chat night. You can actually, before we close the program, I have a phone in hand. You can actually dial the number 240-603-7367. 240-603-7367. If you have a question for Dr. George Nguyen before we wrap up in just a few uh, minutes, 
Um, before we bring back uh, Dr. George Moore on the platform, uh, permit me to say that um, if you know anybody who is making a difference in the lives of people, either by because they've created something uh, that's touching lives, somebody uh, transforming uh, challenges into opportunities, economic opportunities, serving large groups of people. If you know people who are just selfless, regardless of nationality, by all means, contact us. These are the kinds of conversations that the kinds of people we want on our platform for, a con for conversations that are transformative. Right now, we have three broadcast programs on this platform. We have Voices of Africa, which is running now. We also have Healthline, uh, which which is devoted exclusively to um, health and wellness matters. We also have family matters. If you feel that you are a resource person in any of these disciplines, by all means, contact me, and we will bring you on the platform. Ladies and gentlemen, at this point, I'm going to bring back Dr. George Ngoa for his closing remarks. This was intended to be a short conversation with my former teacher. Dr. George Ngoa, let's welcome him once more. Dr. Ngwa, what would you like us to take home as the nuggets for the evening? Well, um, that's a difficult question. But I would encourage us, you know, to, you know, I, I mentioned working together, assisting each other so that we can walk the walk together uh and then uh, basically just help each other uh in any way in any form that we can be there be attentive and lend a hand whenever a hand is stretched so that's the only thing i can say because uh, um we are challenged we're quite challenged working individually i know i said your last <laughs> word but let, let me ask you this question Dr. Ngoa. What would you like to be remembered for? Uh, I would, that I was a listener. I, 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 I did my best to assist those who came to me with problems or just to express themselves. I had that I gave them a shoulder on which to lean. Basically, that's what I would like to be remembered for. I keep saying last word, there's a question coming from China. Dr. Ngwa, do you feel nostalgic about your professional life with Radio Cameroon? I know a journalist, always a journalist. That's a question from China. Yeah, yeah. I, once a journalist, always a journalist, as you've said. Um, but these days, the journalism that we practiced is different from the journalism that is being practiced today. So I would rather be the teacher than the broadcaster that I was. And you taught quite a lot of people. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Ngoa, <laughs> for accepting to come to my platform. And uh, I, I just appre appreciate you a lot, sir. You are one of those I cannot forget. The Yule Lukananga, Yule Lukananga, Kwanka John D4, Fine Henry Fournier, Epsingum, my goodness, I, I, I could go on and on and on and on. <laughs> and I will not end here. I truly appreciate you, sir. Thank you are one of the reasons why journalism became so tasteful, something that, you know, you, you just wanted to do. I'm not sure if we're not doing this, what I'll be doing. <laughs> That's true. I appreciate you, sir. I will never forget you. Thank you, sir. Thanks very much, Divine. It takes two. Never forget that it takes two. So the, the success is shared. Thank you very much for giving me a platform to express myself. And that's how we wrap up this week's edition of Voices of Africa with one of my former instructors, Dr. George Ngwa. Thank you so much for watching and share this video. Be the ambassadors, worthy ambassadors of Voices of Africa, Chat Night Africa, if you like. I want to thank my producer, who is in Lagos right now, ensuring that this broadcast is aired concurrently 
on different platforms across the globe. My name is Divine Chiamakong. I'm in Washington, D.C. anchoring this broadcast. I will see you again for yet another exhilarating broadcast. I thank you all and have a good week. Bye for now. Coming back. I'm coming back. I'm coming. Coming to get down. I'm coming. I'm coming. Coming to dance. To dance. We're going to dance. We're going to dance. We're going to get down. We're going to get down. We're going to party. Party hard. We're going to book it. Boogie woogie, and when we jam, it's out of sight. This song right here, it's dynamite. I'm ready.